three, two, one. <laughs> Welcome to the Wiggly Podcast. I'm here in Lower Blakemere sitting room, sat on the Wiggly sofa with Rach, Farmer Phil, and Hannah. Hannah, I'm so pleased to have Hannah on because she's an organic gardener. You'll have heard her on last week's show, and she is very nervous, listener. I don't know why, because we're sat on the sofa having a cup of tea. Oh, you haven't got a cup of tea, have no, you? No, I haven't. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, I've got a cup reason. of tea, because obviously I'm the hostess <laughs> with the mostess. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the reason that Hannah's here is because she is an organic gardener and also keeps bees. And we heard from Mr. Jenny Steele, Alan, some time ago about his bees. And I just wanted to get Hannah in to mention her bees because Ricardo is going to wiggle his way up to Kington to see what you're up to. But just give me a view on how many beehives you've got and what, what you're actually doing with the bees. Right, I've got six hives at the moment. Yeah. Possibly might be going down to five because one of them is looking a bit sickly at the moment. They're just getting into action now. Queen's starting to lay her eggs. Brood's being brought on. Do you keep them all in your garden then? No, uh, it's my boyfriend's parents' farm. We've got yeah. um, a nice corner right at, on the top of a hill. It's quite sheltered, there's hedgerow all around it. But close enough for me to just pop up there and have a look at them. And do you have to go up there often to see what's going on? I get up there every weekend just to make sure there's nothing going on up there that shouldn't be. Yeah. Make sure they're all still standing up. But this time of year it's pretty quiet. It's just a case of going up there and checking everything's OK. So they're actually building at the moment? Yeah, the Queen's laying her eggs now. She's just probably started in the last sort of month or so. Now the weather's warming up a bit. And so when should we come and see the action? When will they swarm? Swarming, usually May time. Whenever the oilseed rape comes out, that's usually when they start swarming. OK, so we'll come up and explore your beehives. Yeah. Be Wiggle good. our way up to Kington yeah. then. But thank you for coming in. OK, thank you. So, coming up on this week's show, we have no Ricardo. He's currently on holiday in South Africa. So happy holidays to him. But we have Monty's Wormcast. We have an interview with Alan Shepherd, who wrote that fabulous book, Curious Incidents in the Garden at Nighttime. And Rach has got in front of her a book called Water, Use Less, Save More. 100 Water Saving Tips for the Home. And I am going to ask her random numbers throughout this podcast. So, Rach, please give me tip number 68... For saving water. Okay, number 68. Place organic mulch into the planting holes of thirsty plants, such as sweet peas, beans, marrows and melons, before planting out. This will improve the ability of the soil to hold moisture around the roots. You could do that with bokashi, because when you take it out, it's really wet. That's yeah. true. There yep. you are. There we are, another tip. Fantastic. We've got Farmer Phil in, and he's going to moan about DEFRA, I'm quite sure, because that new report <laughs> has just come out about the fact that they all need sacking. <laughs> so we'll be talking to him and having an update about the calf that was born on show 71. And on that note, Farmer Phil has just given me the photo of that calf. So if you go to my blog, wigglywigglers.blogspot.com, you will see it there. But, Rach, we have had a week of media, haven't we? We have. We've had loads and loads of attention this week. And, and it started with this article by Sarah Sands. And I must say thank you to Sarah Sands because it's in the Daily Mail. And she writes, I love my can of pet worms. And she's, there's a picture by Gary of her with an angel halo over her head because she's recycling a can of worms and she tells us all about it. Just imagine, she says, if Culture Secretary Tessa Giles' estranged husband David Mills had owned a wormery. He might never have had to go on trial in Italy and his marriage would still be intact. <laughs> <laughs> and that's because she suggests that we shred our tax statements and put them <laughs> in the, the wormery. Work. Anyway, if you want to read this article, which is great for us, but also is really funny... Go to my blog, wigglywigglers.blogspot.com, because I've put a link in to the Daily Mail article online. 
And then that spawned more media, didn't it? It did. Who phoned you up? Yeah, we had the people from the Richard and Judy show phone up, wanting to feature it on there. And so the can of worms, which is the same one as Sarah is using, and we sent that along with a couple of other wormeries down there for them to feature on their next evening's show. Mm, And it did, but they had a few facts wrong, didn't they? They did, yeah. But you've contacted them, haven't you? Yes, I have, yeah. But it was great to have the coverage on there. Yeah, and the next evening we were on How to Go Green, which is the people in um, Devon who are going green in their garden. And there was our worms just arriving through the post. So it's all action. And also, we've just yesterday been on Country File. So I hope you enjoyed that. If you didn't get to see it, then go to the BBC website and I'm sure it'll be up there again. And we've also got an article by Harriet Copperman, and that's in Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust magazine. And she's had a can of worms for three years. So all positive this week. And here is some feedback that we've had in from our questionnaire competition. And the winners are all up now on the homepage. So have a look and see if you've won. I'm not going to give you names out on here. Um, But this is handy, you see. You can use your wormery for other things. Dr. Hannah says, Your wormery is a great favourite with our cat, who sits on it to look in at the kitchen window to ask to be let in. See? (laughs) Multifunctional. (laughs) I tell you what, once at a show, I had a chap come up and say, Do you know, Heather, you ought to sell these as barbecues? And I said, It's plastic (laughs) (laughs) not gonna work that is true and that was at hampton court palace flower show but there we are farmer phil hi how are you farming has made the main press this week well it's more of the same boring old rubbish isn't it really oh well we won't talk about it rach (laughs) give me please tip number 71 (laughs) oh heck 71 quick i will come back to it. that'll be the one after number 70 rach right (laughs) right on the turn of a page don't bring moist soil to the surface by owing or digging mulch instead (laughs) owing owing instead (laughs) owing sorry or digging (laughs) mulch instead Okay, should we let him come in on his farmer's problems? Okay, it's going to have to happen. Have you received, please, the whole of your single farm payment? I remember we had a little celebration when you got a payment. What is the position? And do try not to moan. Well, the situation is that I'm pleased to report that we have received our environmental stewardship subsidy for the farm in Wales, which is called Tear Cunnel, which is good news. Uh, sadly, we've had no other subsidy from our Welsh farm for either 2005 or 2006. But I have been pressing the unfortunate lady who was assigned to us to sort all this out, and she has now promised me that she is going to get us some payment for 2005 on a manual payment because they can't persuade the computer to work. It was interesting this week that the all-party committee that were tasked with looking at DEFRA and the RPA's activities over the last two years, came up with one of the most damning reports that any all-party committee have ever come up with. And basically, the essence of their report was how can government ministers waste £500 million and then be, in two cases, promoted for doing so. Well, Um, they haven't actually wasted the £500 million yet, though, have they? Because that's if the European Parliament imposes the fine. Some, some of that figure includes the fine, but I'm led to believe that at least half of it is increased costs in trying to cope with the fact that they couldn't cope with the task that they uh, had put in front of them. And I'm sad to report that there is now some evidence that part of their problems were due to the digital mapping of all farmland in England, Wales and Scotland. And I read a report this week that suggested that the Ordnance Survey data that they were using is four or five years old, and there is a new set of data that came out in 2006, courtesy of the Ordnance Survey, and they're considering updating the mapping, which, if that goes half as well as the original exercise, (laughs) that will (laughs) crucify it completely. If Margaret Beckett was sat on the sofa next to you, and for those listeners who perhaps outside the UK, Margaret Beckett was the Environment Secretary at the time that the Royal Payments Agency started on this great um, adventure of um, changing the way that farming 
was subsidised. If she was sat next to you on this sofa without any um, swear words, what would you say to her? I think Margaret, I'd have, listen in. I'd have to say to her that it's hard enough to justify agricultural subsidy, but if you are going to squander sums of money of between 250 and 500 million pounds, how many schools, hospitals, whatever else that government money should be spent on would that figure buy? And I would suggest it was significant. And therefore, it's not just farmers that it's impinging on. They're the first ones in the firing line. But in this case, it's all the rest of the environment, the British Waterways Board, all the people who receive money from DEFRA are going to suffer because of their incompetence. And how would she justify it? I'm sure she'd manage to justify it one way or another. Well, sadly, Margaret Beckett can't be with us today because she's actually been promoted to Foreign Secretary and is currently trying to get 15 naval personnel out from Iran. Well, it, uh, there was a very funny blog on the Farmers Weekly Interactive website yeah. which commented on just that subject. And Is- Isabel Davis, who is the Farmers Weekly business editor, had written some very amusing comments on their basically along the lines that if she were one of the 15 folk in Iran, that she would be very concerned on the basis that uh, Mrs Beckett would no doubt say, well, it'll be all right, we might get the bulk of them out in <laughs> due course. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, so that, you know, if she applies the same level of competence to that, it's not terribly funny, really, because I really feel for the families and yeah, the people involved. But... but to have that level of incompetence that high in government is just no good to any of us. On a lighter note, um, I actually got to go over to the European Parliament this week to lobby MPs about a directive coming out that affects small business trading in inside Europe, and it's called Rome One. So I was you know, pleased to go over and put my point of view to them. But while I was in the Parliament... Um, Andrew from the Federation of Small Business said that it's often really amusing because they're all listening in different languages and often the translators are really struggling to keep up with it. And in the BSE crisis, there was a moment when they were discussing the export of frozen semen from prize bulls in the UK to other European countries. And one of the interpreters mistook frozen semen for cold sailors <laughs> <laughs> apparently there was complete uproar about exporting cold sailors <laughs> from the UK to all these other countries and they had to start again and rethink the whole thing isn't that lovely yeah. right Rach please number 81 ok 81 Floating plants such as water lilies also help reduce evaporation and provide shade for fish and other pond life. Cover at least half the pond with these floating plants to provide large shaded areas. Richard would like that one, wouldn't he? Well, would he? Because he's not sure he likes fish in the pond, does he? Because they eat the frog spawn, don't they? Yeah, but putting lilies on the top means that the water doesn't evaporate. That that was the point. You're on the saving water (laughs) book. Saving water, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) What's been going on the farm, Phil? Well, more of the same, really. We weaned the last lot of calves this week. So they've gone to Will Morgan's this week. I think last week we mentioned that we were doing the pre-movement TB testing and they were all clear. So they've all gone up there to be fattened. So we've got one or two disgruntled mothers about the place who are pining for their calves. We've been spreading fertiliser, so we're sort of gradually getting to the point of thinking about turning the cattle out as soon as the weather looks set fair enough. Fertiliser really affects your carbon footprint because there's so much energy used in producing it. Will Mm. you ever move over to a slightly more environmentally conscious form of... It's a a difficult equation because if you look at organic fertilisers, so spreading farmyard manure or chicken manure or whatever, there is an awful lot of energy goes into both moving it and spreading it, and so that although I am receptive to arguments on carbon footprints, in in my view, I'm not convinced. The effectiveness of artificial, so-called artificial fertilisers, and the fact that we need so little of them, in my view, currently at any rate, outweighs the energy and effort required to spread large quantities of organic fertilisers. And if you include some of the uh, sewage sludge and paper waste 
fertilizers and so on that are available to us i'm not entirely sure about the residues there are heavy metal problems and all sorts so it's it's not a clear cut case in my view anyway uh, but your m- manure is going off farm isn't it that's right yeah i think that farmyard manure is of more benefit as a organic matter provider rather than a straight nitrate provider so it's a soil conditioner rather than a fertilizer there are nitrates in it but it requires quite a lot of nitrate to actually break it down so that its real benefit is in organic matter and because our rotation includes grass which if you measure it a two-year grass lay puts far more organic matter into the soil than you could ever spread muck on it and because we're seed growers we don't want the contamination from the seeds within the muck So we have grass in the rotation which fixes the organic matter and we export the muck onto our neighbour's farm so it benefits his field and so that's the way we deal with that for reasons of cleanliness of the fields really. And the question on my listeners' lips is undoubtedly, did the bulls get any? They certainly did. (laughs) Because last week's podcast was about the bulls having their first love fest of the year. Well, we turned the bulls in, as we said we would last week, and uh, yes, they have been thoroughly enjoying themselves. They they have calmed down a little. Obviously, the first couple of days are complete overexcitement, rains, and there's chaos everywhere, but uh, life is back to normal now, and uh, everybody seems very happy. Fantastic. Rach, number 22, please. Okay, number 22 from the water book. Ah, this a lot. this is a good one. In fact, this is one you could do with Rich. Bath with a friend. <laughs> <laughs> you know how environmentally friendly he is. <laughs> oh, good <laughs> Sorry, Lord. Farmer Phil. <laughs> oh, I can't get over that one. We'll have to have another now. <laughs> eleven. Oh, number eleven. To another page. Waste disposal units. Use a considerable amount of water. Get composting. Put the vegetable peelings in your compost bin. What have Wiggly's been telling you for years? Absolutely. Have any of you listened in to the Jeremy Vine show on Radio 2? I do afternoon? listen to it. I listen um, to when it I most can, days. Yeah. Yeah. Whether I've heard what you're about to ask me, I don't know. Well, every two weeks there's a report from Terry Walton. He's an allotment owner and he reports in exactly what's going on with his allotment. He's got the most gorgeous voice. Yeah, it's very Welsh, very yeah. strong Welsh voice, isn't it? And he's just bought a book actually called My Life on a Hillside Allotment, which I've got to get. But no matter. We um, have got an article coming out in Saga magazine, written by a wonderful woman called Maureen Cleave. Anyway, um, we've come up with the idea of having a partner podcast with Saga, and they've approached Terry, who also writes for Saga magazine, and he's going to use some composting methods from Wiggly Wigglers, probably a can of worms, and so there will be that special podcast coming out. So I will let you know, dear listener, how and when to get that. It will no doubt be available as a Wiggly podcast, but it will also be available through Saga. And on that note of partnering up, Pod3 TV came here yesterday, Neil Fairbrother, who I understand is a bit of a guru in podcasting, video casting terms in the UK, and he came to film the background to Wiggly Wigglers and how he set up for his Focus in Business show. So I'll let you know when that comes out. But in the meantime, if you want to know how to prune your roses, specifically, you must go to Through the Garden Gate, and it's on pod3.tv, because I've watched... Adrian pruning his roses and I can happily report he knows what to do. Great. <laughs> Number 24. Oh, 24, sorry. I thought, there, right? Sorry, I thought you were uh, <laughs> going oh, on to the dear. next thing. 24 is... Oh, next page. 24. If you have an older toilet, you can reduce the amount of water it uses by fitting a free water-saving hippo or save a flush in your cistern contact your water company to get one free and there's a couple of websites www.hippo-the-watersaver.co.uk and www.save-a-flush.co.uk you can put a brick in it i was going to say is that the same as putting a brick in it (laughs) 
that's true. I think it is. I think it is. But true. if you've got an older loo, put the brick in gently because those uh, ceramic cisterns are easy to break. So don't chuck it in there. See, handy Phil. Handy farmer Phil. Handy Phil farmer tips. tip. Put stones in your cistern. Now, the other week, Richard, myself and Sam got the chance to go up to CAT, Centre of Alternative Technology in McCunsliffe in Wales. And we had a great day. They've got all sorts of things going on there, including a rocket composter, which they're going to try some Bukashi in because it was a little bit whiffy. And all sorts of ideas for insulating your home. But we also got to meet Alan Shepherd, who wrote Curious Incidents in the Garden at Night Time, which was a fantastic book that we reviewed on Podcast 8. So if you want to go back and see what we thought, it was a milker from me, go to Podcast 8. But we got to meet up with him and here's all about his latest book from Richard at Cat. Alan, it's lovely to meet you. We've, we've come all nice the way to, to, um, to the Centre of Alternative Technology at Mahanlis. Um, and uh, actually, for the listeners' benefit, if, if you haven't come here, it's well worth a visit. So, Sandra, Heather, and I have, have freighted up here and we met some fantastic people today. Freight? That's a good word. Yeah. Freight. <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, it, it, means, it means driven at considerable speed. <laughs> So my knuckles were white <laughs> earlier on. Unfortunately, we got stuck behind a couple of lorries, which is great. But, but if you're ever going anywhere with Heather, always drive. <laughs> or don't turn up late. Or don't turn up late, you know. I was a little bit late. Not too much, only, only, a, only a few minutes. <laughs> but but anyway, we've, we've come up. Now, Alan... Uh, is a, a writer second to none. He's, he's written some absolutely fantastic books, and, and interestingly, you really like the last interestingly, one, right? one of the first things he said to me <laughs> as we met was, well, "Why, why did you insult me so much when you, when you, re- when you reviewed my book?" But uh, what was the, the title? It of was it's called "The Curious Incidents at Night." <laughs> okay. Something like that. <laughs> what's, it called again? What's, it, what's it called again? It's called Curious Incidents in the Garden at Night Time. Curious Incidents in the Garden at Night Time, yeah. And I remember saying it was slightly effeminate. You did, I, you did, yeah. So. I, but I did, I did say it was, it was good. It was very well written. And, and it had fantastic fact, subject matter. I think you said no red blooded Englishman will ever read this book. <laughs> I think that was the exact. But well, you can right. check that when you okay. get it. Okay, okay, well, I, yeah, yeah, and I, I apologise for that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, when I read it the second time around, because Heather did tell me off, said, no, you, what are you talking about, you stupid boy? It's really a good book. And, uh, and, and, it, and interestingly, the second time around, when I've when I gotten over my, my red bloodedness, <laughs> I, I realised. So it is absolutely superb, but it is romantic, isn't it? It is, it is. that is fair to say, yes. But to, how many books have you written, all told? Uh, I think it's about 16 um, right. in, in total. But there, lots of those are quite small, though, to be fair. They're like right. um, little books, little books. Like the slug books. The slug books, yeah. little books of slugs. That was a good fun. Yeah. One. That is a, is a brilliant little book. I was saying to... Um, your friend, colleague Suzanne, 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 Suzanne yeah. uh, about the, the fact that I've got it. Just, just, in fact, it's sat on my desk, oh. and uh, and it, it's and it's an amazing little book. Because if you flick through it, there's a little picture of a slug. There is. That, bigger, bigger, that's probably the time. best thing about it. <laughs> to be fair. But it's, um, it's often a, it's a little gem that I often recommend when I do gardening tours to, to to people because you know the classic question is how do we control slugs and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And I say get that little book. It's a superb little little handbook. Beautiful. Um, um, but you've just you've just recently or almost finished. I know it's finished. And it's right, finished. It's right. at the printers at right. the moment. Right, which is right. exciting and, and scary because I can't change anything now. It's it's all done. It's all over. And, and what's yeah, it called? It's, it's called the organic garden. Right. A uh, year and a half in the making. Yeah. It's a big uh, full color coffee table type book about organic gardening. Did you say there's something like seventy thousand words? Seventy thousand words. Yeah, I had about. I worked it out when I when I got the job to to write it for Harper Collins. I had seventy days to write it. And so I worked out I had to write a thousand words a day. And uh, I've never done that before. <laughs> so <laughs> that was quite interesting. Any, any writer's block along the way? Uh, no, I didn't have time for that. I didn't no, have time. No. I had to be. <laughs> I didn't have time. I didn't have time for that. No, uh, efficiency. Uh, no, just work through it. So what are, you, what, are you, what are you looking at? What are you sort of concentrating on within the book? In, within the book, um, it's, uh, it's a kind of wider than... Uh, it's an introduction to organic gardening. Um, but it's wider than that. It looks at uh, ethical considerations for materials and for 
plants where you buy your plants from local it's very it's all about local communities right. it's very much based around kind of what we've been doing in in Mahuncliffe uh, with CAT and with the Eco Dovey the which is a local organization uh, about supporting local agriculture and local communities and it's very much about thinking how we can have a less impact on the planet and there's parts of the book about global warming which hasn't been in uh, you know that sort of gardening book before so right. that's all new and uh, I've tried to written it in my style which I, I hope is quite friendly and easy for people to read so that it's kind of my take on things really um, and it's published in association with CAT so it has a kind of strong link to what I've been doing in the past but it's for HarperCollins and it's great because you know they're a big company and they've really taken on board all the ideas in the book and they're really you know they haven't been edited in that way you know right, they're really yeah. happy to kind of go with it and you know I've been surprised because we've been trying to do this sort of stuff for so long mm. you know you forget that actually the rest of the world is coming on board now and they're all getting into it and so it's quite a surprise to, to meet publishers in London and um, for them to be so enthusiastic about the book and to think that yeah. there's people out there who really want to read the stuff and, yeah, yeah. and it's got a great market so it's yeah it's We're been very looking beautiful. forward to it and me too, yeah. It's very beautiful. It's got some really great photos in of, of this area and of uh, the HDRA garden at Yolding and there's some of Jeff Hamilton's garden in Barnes and right. some pictures of right. that. Right. It's very beautiful. It's really, you know, it's been really nicely designed and it's on FSC paper. Right. So they've okay. gone the whole hog with the paper and it's, it's made in, in Britain, so it's not being shipped in from... You know, Hong Kong. Yeah, sure. So. It's a fairly consistent book then, really, isn't well, it? Well, that's what we've tried to do. We try to, as much as possible, try to be as, as green as possible. And uh, yeah. Listen, yeah, one to, one to look forward to. I'm, I'm really looking forward to my free copy. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing you said well, to me, you, you, were, you were slightly more complimentary over the Wiggly book. The not, Wiggly book's lovely. Not that I had a great I mean, deal of uh, anything to do with really writing, like writing the Wiggly book, but... <laughs> But uh, you said you enjoyed that. Yeah. I did. That's a, it's a lovely book. It's really, really nicely written. And uh, it's good. a good mix of the kind of practical stuff that you need to know about wildlife gardening, right. but also about why you've done it, the way you've done it, and uh, you know, how the garden, why the garden exists, and, and tied it in with it. Yeah, it was really nice. It was a really good book. Excellent. Yeah, yeah it is. And, uh, we were very pleased with it, weren't we? Yes, and isn't Alan more gracious than you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, actually, I find it a bit feminine. <laughs> Um, <laughs> <laughs> he is, he is very much to me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I don't know. Have you guys enjoyed your visit today to Cat? I had a great time. I tell you, one of the things I learned was how the mail order department works. Yes. And it's very similar to ours, is which it? is In, pretty down to earth, yeah, yeah. but a lot of action. Chaotic yeah. and disorganised. Yeah. <laughs> so very down to earth and a lot of action. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. that's your interpretation. Great to see the rocket composter. Oh yeah, did you, did you like the smell? Well, yeah. no, I didn't. No, no, so, it's... Um, Bit of work a few to be done on that. Are we going to send some Bacassi up, aren't we? For to them try to try. And, uh, yeah. yeah, good. Try and see, see if that reduces the smell. smell. Mm. Um, um, but yeah, it great day. Really enjoyed it. Oh, great. Let's see and and, and the, uh, the, the, uh, the icing on the cake was meeting you, Alan. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, and likewise um, for my day as well. <laughs> Busy uh, cleaning Such a liar, right? Um, yeah, such a sincere man. You really are. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we're very masculine yeah yeah absolutely absolutely well thank you very much well, and, you, uh, and, and for coming. we'll look forward to your your next May the book, your next book. May the 8th May the 8th okay. yes. okay. can we get some signed copies on? we certainly can yes. fantastic yes. alright so we look forward to that day yeah, good thanks Anna alright <laughs> range number 30 okay number 30 uh, it's about this section is water in your garden. Anyway, number 30 is use a water butt to collect rainwater from your roof rather than wasting treated drinking water on your garden. I thought number 31 was quite good too. I'm carried away now. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> use two water butts or more and link them so that when one is full, the surplus water is diverted into the others. Farmer Phil, we wondered how the cow had managed who had the calf that had to be cut up inside her from last week's show. I'm pleased to report that she was down for three days and we used our lifting net, which is a, a fitted device that you put underneath her and picks her up and supports her 
all over her body, really. Hang you, on a minute, how? You pick Do her up with a loader and the net is shaped. It's fitted so it's got bits that go between her front legs and her back legs to support those and round her belly. So and like when you see, you know, like when they're transporting a fish or something? Yeah, but more fitted than that. The idea being that you can have her standing on her four feet but not necessarily taking her whole weight. So we lifted her up each day in that. And then on the third day, we'd, we'd given her quite a lot of anti-inflammatory because the, the problem is swelling around her pelvis area and it presses on the nerves. And so we imagine that it's either a feeling like intense pins and needles or it's just that sort of weak and feeble, everything gives way feeling. And it's probably a combination of the two, but because cows are heavy, we think they get pins and needles. And if you don't move them and take the pressure off, they lose the use of the, the leg that they're lying on. And so you have to move them around gently. Couldn't um, you just lie her on her side? Well, it, cows' digestions don't work when they're laid down. That's the other problem, is they have to get the gas out. And ah. it, it's, all, it's a difficult thing and it's very complicated but the idea is that if the cow's mental state is right and she'll keep trying and she'll keep eating and drinking properly then her guts can continue to work properly which is the main thing and it gives time for the swelling to go down and we were using anti-inflammatory drugs to help speed that up and uh, on the fourth day as Rob and I approached her with the JCB in the net, she decided that uh, a more comfortable idea might be to get up, so she did and walked off. So, <laughs> <laughs> so do you hold the digger? So you, do you tie up a tractor with a loader on the front of it and leave it there for we the d- day? You do, no, you, you, you pick her up and leave it there for perhaps half an hour maximum. The idea is to pick them up for long enough to get rid of any pins and needles and to allow them to the muscles to start to regain the strength if you hold them up for too long the pressure of the net starts to impinge on them so and they'll soon let you know they don't want to be you know it either hurts or they're uncomfortable and they want to be put back down again but it just allows and and the other thing of course is that it allows the the bit of cow that was lying on the ground to dry out and get air to it so they don't get sore because that's the other problem with them when they're on the ground for a long time they get very sore and it's very difficult to treat. You can't because, you know, they're, they're big, heavy animals. Do you ever have to do this on your farm, Rach? Yes, we have the same sort of reasons. I have trouble with the cow calving and then you get the vet in, get the calve out and the cow will stay down for quite a while. And so, yeah, sometimes. OK. Now, just before we go, I did want to share this little bit of choice information because, guys, we've sold our first... Rat trap, baby, and you being car. <laughs> <laughs> so that's absolutely wonderful. So happy rat trap to that person who's bought that item. And just before we go, here's Monty with his worm cast. Monty's worm facts. Young worms hatch from their cocoons in three weeks to five months as their gestation period varies for different species of worms. Thank you, Monty. It's Easter holidays coming up, so he'll be in the Wiggly recording studio, i.e. the sitting room, <laughs> the sofa, <laughs> <laughs> to record another dose of Wormcast. And no doubt, Michael, he will be bringing his guitar. <laughs> so, bye from the Wiggly team at Blakemere. It's bye from me, Heather. Rach, goodbye. Bye from me, Farmer Phil. And if you really love this show, please don't forget to go and subscribe at iTunes. And that means that every week we'll automatically land on your iPod just before work on a Monday morning. Bye-bye. <laughs>